Unfortunately not. It's going to be 10 or 9 or something. Sorry. <laughs> I have to disappoint already. <laughs> yeah. So what I would like to talk about is what I call model reduction. And to sort of make contact with uh, what you've learned so far, you've already encountered model reduction. So you would have, in Jay's uh, lectures, you would have done a reduction where you went from, the, I guess, the shallow water equations and you derived the quasi-geostrophic equations. Okay. So this is a model reduction in a sense where here you had processes or the velocity field had uh, that divergence, uh, components that were not divergent free, whereas here the velocity field was divergent free. Okay, so you had inertia gravity waves that are not being present here, and you filter them out through some kind of asymptotic procedure. So this is a reduction, and it gives you a reduction of complexity that has the following advantage. So first of all, there's a conceptual advantage. These equations are much Nicer, well, nicer behaved, so you can study them. So if you want to zoom at vertical large-scale features, slow large-scale features, this is your kind of your, your, your glasses or your, your, your telescope or microscope, depending on the scale you want to look at or how you want to look at it, uh, with which to view those phenomena. So you can learn about these phenomena by doing this model reduction. So um, there is a the fact of understanding the problem. And the second one is a pr very practical advantage, which is a computational advantage. Because here you have lots of fast processes in, which you filtered out through your asymptotic procedure. You can actually, on a computer, if you want to now solve for these large scale slow features, you can use a coarse or spatial grid, because you're only interested at the, at the core scales. You don't need to resolve all these uh, buoyancy oscillations, these inertia gravity waves. And because these large-scale features are also slower, you can take a much bigger time step in your computer. So there's a computational advantage in this model reduction. Um, here, what we're going to do now is a different type of model reduction. The model reduction now here, you didn't, you didn't actually reduce the number of degrees of freedom. I mean, it, you did in some sense, but you still have all these values on a grid or all, all these Fourier modes um, so far. So what I want to look at now is, let's say, we have a dynamical system, dz dt, that is some h, what did I call it, h of z, and possibly, I'm going to write it dw dt, although you just learned that we can't, uh, I'll do it anyway. Uh, because these derivatives don't exist, so this is Brownian motion. So this is a stuff. This is my deterministic part, and gamma might be zero. Uh, so we may also, uh, but if gamma is non-zero, we may look at stochastic systems. So and z could be this could be an ODE or an SDE. So then z is some capital Z is some R n, but this could also be. You know, your, some Galerkin approximation, this could be a, a PDE, and this would be your Fourier mode. So then your Z would be infinitely, infinite dimensional. Okay, this, we, we, we can cover those, uh, those cases. And let's now say that somehow we can decompose our Z into something that we're interested in. These are our relevant variables X, and something we're not really interested in. Y. We don't want to know about Y, we want to know about X. Okay? So our aim is, so back to the geophysical fluids context, so these could be some vertical modes and this could be uh, uh, the, other, uh, the other modes, right? Or if you look at a climate, then the relevant variables could be your ocean, which is slow, and y would be exactly those vertical modes that in weather forecasting we said are slow, um, could be our now irrelevant variables. We don't want to know what was the weather, you know, on day x. We want to know the long-term dynamics of the ocean. Okay? So the aim is now to find a reduced equation just for x. Okay? So find the dynamics 
of the, let's say, interesting variables x. So we want to somehow find a system x dot is some f of x, so some deterministic part, plus some so u again is Brownian motion, possibly some uh, stochastic part. And then we need to know, once we found that through several procedures, then we need that our, a, our small x here converges or solutions of this equation here for x converge in some sense to solutions of this reduced equation. Okay, so we will talk about a little bit. I don't want to get too much into the theory here. We're going to talk a little bit about in what type of convergence we, uh, we, we're thinking here. Um, okay, so that's the general aim. Um, I would like to start with just deterministic systems, so ODEs, and then build up to stochastic systems, and then in the end also make contact to alpha stable uh, processes and Levy processes. So. What type of noise can we expect here? Okay. And in what type of systems? Um, w is also, sorry, W is Brownian motion. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, so W will always be Brownian motion. This U later on can be something else. Okay. This is just an outline for now. Okay, what, 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 what we're going to discuss. So, this is a great or grand program. When can we expect that so, something like this will work? And there's two um, cases uh, where we can expect this to work. So, the first one is, I already talked about slow, far. So, these are timescale separated systems. Um, so our interesting variables would be the slow variables, and we have to do something with the fast variables, okay, to get to here. And the other, and we're going to discuss why that will work, okay? I'm just telling you for now, this is an outlook. And the second one is what's called weak coupling. So that means we have one interesting variable, and it's coupled weakly to lots of variables that are not interesting. Okay? So think actually of Brownian motion, right? We got a heavy pollen on you know on some water that's constantly kicked by the water molecules. So it's weak coupled to all these gazillions of water molecules. What is the effect of that dynamics? It's a it's Brownian motion, as I, I guess you've learned. Is is that what you did you talk about this from that aspect? Yeah. Okay, so that is one example where something, I mean, just by hand wavy, uh, we, we're going to make this a bit more precise. Uh, arguments, we can get reduced dynamics for the interesting pollen, neglecting all the dynamics of the individual dynamics of the water molecules. Okay, so the methods we're going to use to carry out this program will depend on the dynamics of these non-interesting variables, what they do. Okay, so let's go through all those cases. So depending on the dynamics of the non-interesting, uninteresting variables y, we use different methods. So, for example, let's say y the dynamics is such that y relaxes to a fixed point. Okay, So to a fixed point, let's say we have a scale-separated system. So y is fast, right? our non-interesting uh, variable x is slow. So x is constant for y. So relaxing to a fixed point could mean that y is some function of x. Okay, So this is something we're going to discuss, and that's called, or it's going to get us into the 
what's called center manifold theory. Okay. Then you could have that y doesn't relax to a fixed point, but y could relax to some periodic orbit. Okay. So if y relaxes to a periodic orbit, then the methods we can use, if that, again, if you look only now at, at time scale separated variables, so something is going around and around and around very, very fast, so we can average over this period. So this is a method of averaging. And we can do that deterministically. And that's a very old method. I think Gauss even used it when he looked at the motion of the outer planets. And just Mercury and, and Venus, they were banging around the sun's you know, like crazy, so he just said, okay, that just modifies the mass of the sun. It's like a smeared out mass. So this is where we take into account this motion that we don't want, modify our system, and now can get closed equations for the relevant variables, okay, like the dynamics of the outer, outer planets. Um, now, so we go here in complexity of the Y dynamics you go more complex, so fixed point, periodic orbit, let's take a chaotic attractor. Okay. So C, Y relaxes to a chaotic attractor, or, so this is in the deterministic case, Y relaxes, or Y is an ergodic process. Have you done ergodicity, Michael? No. We're going to define this. So, stochastic process. So, this is deterministic, but there are certain processes where we can do the same spiel. And here we can do lots of things. So, here we can do averaging. We're going to talk about averaging here in a different way to here. And we can also look at what's called homogenization. And we will do so, um, which allows us actually, and we can, I'm going to present you some rigorous results, to get, even if the original dynamics here is deterministic, so if there's no Brownian motion driving my actual system, the actual truth is entirely deterministic, we can get stochastic limits for our relevant variables, okay? So you get diffusion, stochastic behavior, limiting behavior out of something that's entirely deterministic, okay? And that, well, the procedure is called homogenization, and we're gonna, we're gonna talk about that. Um, there is another way of looking at these problems, and this is called, I just mentioned it here, we're gonna discuss this in detail, moritz Zwanzig formalism. which just is basically just a way to rewrite this dynamical system here. Then, fourth, we could have that Y does not relax at all. Why does, you know, why does it need to relax? So, for example, in a Hamiltonian system, there's no, you know, there are no fixed points, there's nothing contracting to a periodic orbit or to an attract. Sorry? Four? Oh, this is a D. Now, okay. So Y does not relax, and neither do I. And <laughs> um, we can look at two cases. First, the time scale separated case. So Y is fast compared to 2X. And this is in some sense you've done here with shallow water, which is a conservative system, right? going to the quasi-geostrophic uh, quasi limit. So there you employed something that's called the slow manifold. So the dynamics happens on some slow manifold, and you look at the dynamics of, on this manifold. Not sure, depending on time, whether we go into that, because it's, that will be entirely deterministic, and our aim is here to go a bit more stochastic. But depending on time and interest, we can, we can go into this. And the second one is that um, Y 
is now in Rn, and n is very, very large, so we have a, like a heat bath, lots of, lots of uh, um, uh, variables. Why? And they're weakly coupled. to our interesting variable x. And then we can use another form of averaging. And again, this moritz wanzig formalism to distill the essential dynamics for our interesting variable x here. So these are these D4 um, scenarios that we're going to look at. Okay. Um, Let's start elementary, let's start deterministically and get some concepts across here and some different ways of looking at dynamics. Okay. So let's suppose we have a dynamical system, deterministic dynamical system, and z dot is h of z. So I want to present three different views of how we can look at this deterministic system. So the first one is, that's the one that we're used to. We're just going to look at pathwise. So we solve the ODE with some initial datum Z0. Okay? So, and we assume all the way through our H is, you know, nice enough. So we have existence and uniqueness of the solution. So given an initial condition, there's a unique trajectory in phase space. Okay. So we have some Z0. And that gives me my Z of T. Um, I will introduce a flow map. The flow map phi... T takes my initial value, but it doesn't have to be just one value. It can be a whole set, which is a nice thing about the flow map. So Z0, and that will be my Z of T where I started at Z0. Okay. So the flow map, this is a very abstract way of looking at dynamics or at solutions of dynamics because we, we, we actually are interested in how to write it down. I mean, if you have a system Y dot is, you know, lambda Y, then yt is, you know, y0 plus whatever, e to the lambda t. What? Yes. Multiply lambda t. So now you know your flow map, right? e to the lambda t. Okay. But if you have a very complicated nonlinear system, no chance of, you know, of getting it. You, I mean, in some sense, your, your computer is... is is an approximation of this flow map, right? If you, if you bang it into a computer, try to solve it there, that is an approximation to that flow map. Um, okay, so let's look at another one. Let's look at what's, what I call probability density picture. So let's say we have initial conditions that are distributed with some density rho node of z, okay? So we draw lots of different initial conditions, okay? Or we have a density with which, according to which we draw these initial conditions. So the question is now in time, how does this density evolve? So this is rho of z and t. So intuitively, oh, that's one better goes down to zero at some stage. So intuitively, we know how to relate those two pictures, right? We could say we now take initial points Z0 from here and take lots of them and propagate them in time. Then, you know, this one might move to here, this one here might move to there and so forth. And then we can, you know, take a histogram and we will get this density, okay? The whole, the whole thing again. Okay, then I, I, I um... 
So let's say we ask a different question. I'll say we have initial conditions. Here we have one initial condition. Okay. Now let's assume our initial conditions, we, we, there's some uncertainty. We don't know really what the initial condition is. And they're distributed according to some probability density function. Let's say Gaussian or uniform. Let's take uniform. Right. So we have, let's say this is minus 1 and plus 1. So this is at time t equal to 0. My initial, I don't know anything about my initial conditions. All I know is that they come some are from here, and they're uniformly distributed. So this one is equally likely to this one, equally likely to that one. So the question is this. In the, the dynamics will not necessarily leave this invariant. It will change this distribution. So if we now propagate this thing in time, so let's say I'm just going out from this is z, time is going out this way, this thing will morph into a different function. Okay, so at every time I can ask the question, given that this was my initial distribution, what's the distribution at a later time t? Okay, so this is now time, and then this might go into something that looks like this. So this would be now my row of z and t. I've just spotted colored chalk. So how are they related? Related, I mean, how is this pathwise picture related to this density picture? Take any initial condition here, let's say this is z1, z2, z3. These are all initial conditions. Oh, can you read this? Probably not, right? Let's just take two, z1, z of 0, 1, and this here is z of time 0, 2. These are my initial conditions. And I now follow that path in time. So after time t, this will be mapped let's say, to here, so this is z2 of, oops, of t, and this one, let's say, will be mapped to here. Okay, so if this is our density, then many more initial conditions will be mapped to where, to here, than to here, and almost none will be mapped to here by our flow. Okay? So that's a question we don't know. We have to see. Okay? We want to find an equation for the time evolution of this you specify it. Ah, you just specify it. You can, you can take anything you like. It's your choice. So, for example, here, in this picture here, we did the delta measure. Okay? So this means we know for certain that our initial condition. And this one here, we either make it up, you know, or it is somehow given through some measurements. Hmm? It could be experimental. We could get it, you know, we could get some guess from experiments. Okay? That's right. Yeah. Okay, so now we could ask a third question, or there's a third picture, and let's say we have now an observable. Right. Hmm? It don't be so impatient. <laughs> Gee. Wait, shall I write down the reduced equation now? And just... well, then? Um, am I too slow? Is that what you're suggesting? <laughs> yeah, as if. Observable uh, picture. I just want to present three pictures and then see how to relate them and why we want to use one or the other. Okay, so we're going to relate all those pictures. We're going to find evolution equations for this. Okay, so the next one is observable, or if you have an observable, or later on we're going to look at expectation values. Um, so we could say we have some function, an observable, temperature or something, that depends on z. Okay, so let's interpret this as an initial condition then this will go to some phi of z of t. So, this is a small phi. This is a big phi. Right? Greek. Just Google it. That's small. <laughs> capital. Just put in Greek letter phi. Yeah, you see, that's... 
they, that's the people from the south of Greece, okay? The people from the north of Greece, they write it like this, okay? Any other colloquial? What's that? <laughs> right, okay. Huh? Okay, so let's make it very slow then. Now, come on, kids. Enough. Uh, where I actually need to make a distinction later on is how I write this Z, but you'll, you'll see. Um, okay, so the question is, what's an evolution equation of an observable? Or let's say we have an expectation value, let's call it V, which is the expectation value of phi at time zero. And that should go to some x v of z and t, which is the expect expectation value of phi of z of t, such that z of 0 was some initial condition. So this is now, you, oh, this is a different z here. This is now an initial condition z, where this z here is the z the solution of my pass. So this is actually where you could have made an intelligent comment about my handwriting. I could, but then later on I would have to write a PDE with z0, and there I think the kind of laziness of the mathematician comes in that you mentioned earlier. Thank you. Okay. All right, so there are these three pictures now. And how are they related? Yes? That's right. You, could do, you see, that, that's, that's what we're going to establish. How are they related? So just take an initial condition, use it as a particle, and take now your observable. You measure the, the temperature of this particle, yeah? So you go down, you follow the particle, and you measure the temperature. That's what you would be doing, right? So that's following this path here. Okay. So clearly, the dynamics, the ODE, the Z dot equal H of Z, will determine how these fields are now evolving, okay? All right. So let's actually start with the observable case and now pin down what's the dynamics of this. So how are they related? Intuitively, we kind of said, okay, we follow, you know, a particle, or we take all these initial conditions, propagate them in time, and then via histograms or so, we get, you know, how, how an initial density will evolve. Um, but let's look this now. Let's look at this sort of more formally. So we're given an ODE. Z dot is H of Z. Okay. So now we consider an observable. So this is a function. And I'm going to use this z of t. So this is now an independent variable here. So this is when you first learn about this, something that has the potential to confuse. This is now an independent variable. So this z is different to this z here. Okay. Um, now, the question is that you've all been eagerly asking, what's this dv? dv is 1. Okay, there's a function that depends on z, so on space and time. So there will be PDE, dtv, and what is it? What's the right hand? What's propagating it? Okay. So intuitively, and we also need, of course, Specify the, uh, sorry, this is phi of z. Okay. So intuitively, we just propagate this 
uh, a solution of this would be propagating just a phi z of t would be phi of the, uh, uh, the propagation of this point. Sorry? Yes. That's correct. Yes. Not little z of t. I mean, this is a question mark. It, it, that's not a letter. Sorry? Yes. No, no. This is fixed now, independent variable. Okay? All right, so I, I think we better do it. So let's see what happened. So let's, let's see that um, so our intuition is V of Z T so the solution is this phi evaluated at now small phi our, fl our, our flow on this Z so let's verify this and by verifying this we will actually find out what's the right hand side of this PD so let's verify it first for t equal to naught. For t equal to naught, phi naught, we haven't done anything, so that's just z. Phi of z is v of z naught. That's our initial condition. Okay. Okay. So now let's take positive t. So let's write our phi of z differently. Let's write it as a v at time t, but now we pull back the time with the flow. So we take v of minus t z. That brings us back to the initial point, and that will be phi of z. Okay. So now we can do a ddt. of this v of phi minus t z t, well, that doesn't depend on t, so that's zero. And now what we do is a chain rule. Right. So t comes in through here, and t comes in through here. So this will be d d t, partial t. That's this one. And now plus dt of this argument times the gradient of v. Okay, so gradient is with, uh, derivative with respect to z. Okay, so plus gradient v of phi minus t z t times d dt of our friend here. So this one is per definition of the flow here, of the flow map. That's the DDT of, if, if we, we transform time, we're going backwards in time now. So this is a solution, the phi z is a so phi t z would be our solution of the forward time. So phi minus t is going backward, and we do the DDT. So this is the h of z, but evaluated at phi minus t. So this is h of phi minus t z with a minus because we're going backwards in time. Okay? So now we can write, and this is equal to zero. So what we end up with is, let me write it down, ddt, v. Now we can evaluate this at every z. We can go to every z. So this is completely arbitrary here. So we could just relabel now z t plus a minus, sorry, h, and now again I do the relabeling here, dot grad v z t equal to zero. This one? So this one is clear. This depends on t. Okay, so let's call this 
Well, th this is your first argument. So you do you first do derivative of v, v with respect to the first argument. That's this one. That's a dv dz. Z is our first argument. Times the inner derivative, which is the ddt of this. So grad, grad whatever uh, w is d w dz. Okay. So gradient is just the d with respect to z. Z happens to be the first. Yes, it is. So this is the ice component of it would be dw. I'm not sure what the... Yes. This is, this is the chain rule, right? You get first, I mean, you do first this. Yeah? No. So grad is just the z. Yep. Yeah? Okay. Yes? Yes? Yes. We do in here, okay? If we write phi t, but we can, right? We just, we just, the inverse exists. So this is actually, we're gonna, this, there's a group structure here. We can go back, the inverse exists. Yes? Yes? It's, it's just a group through this propagation, this trend, you know, you take a set, you go there, so I can go, if I wanna go to here, I can go first to here, and then from there to there, right? H Lipschitz, yeah, we said it's, yeah, we have existence and uniqueness, yeah? And if we have that, then we have a group. And the group will be responsible why this thing here is called a generator. So what we have now is our D, DTV of ZT, I call it curly L, V, of z uh, t, and the l is called the generator, and is now minus h, it's the operator, minus h z dot gradient. So who? Plus, sorry. Which line? This one. So here, we just, we, we specified any t, and kind of any z here, okay? So we can now reach every point here, let's say. So we can, re we call this thing now capital, Z, or the, the, we call this now this kind of z with these two things in here. Because we can do that for any t, we can do that for any z, so we can go to any point z here. Okay, so I just call it z. So that's the pre-image of this. Sorry, that's, that, that's the pre-image of that. This one here, you mean? How do I get this? Can, can we do that after? It's a chain rule. I'll, I'll show you after. Okay. So now I rewrite this bit here as a curly L, and that's an operator H dot grad, and the grad is a DDZ. Okay. And you mentioned the group property, so that's where the name um, that's where the name uh, 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 generator comes from. So we have now. An evolution equation, so it's a PDE for a linear PDE. So we and we have V of Z naught is some phi of Z. So an initial value problem is a Cauchy problem, and we can formally write the solution as an operator e to the LT on phi. Okay. So and this thing here is now a group. So negative, the inverse exists. That's our assumption here. In the stochastic case, 
it will be semi-group. The inverse will not exist. But at the moment, we talk about the deterministic case. Okay, so now you can define the generator. This is just a remark. Since you ask about uh, the group thing, now you can define the generator as take your e to the lt minus identity over t, right? which is the usual way you, in, in, in group theory, how you define the generators. Okay? No? Let's talk about the group. The group search that will not be essential. It, it's, you know, associativity, you can check all this. We, we, can, we can do that after. Okay? All right. Sorry? Yeah? If H, so the problem, <laughs> if you can show that if your H is Lipschitz, so if you have uniqueness and existence of your ODE system, yes, then you also have, you can have solutions to this point wise. Right? Okay, so so far we haven't talked anything about stochasticity, right? Nothing has been random so far, okay? So now we can introduce some random, if you have these deterministic systems, we can introduce the hasticity only through our initial conditions. Okay? So let's introduce some uncertainty in the initial conditions and then find out what is now the time evolution of these densities here. Okay? So to do that, we need to first introduce the L2 adjoint of this generator. So we have L star, the L2 adjoint is just minus, oh let me take Jean-Luc's thing, put a little dot here, minus rho, and now we got a rho h dot. So this is the formal L2 adjoint. Okay. Um, I should say by the way here, this operator e to the LT, this propagator, is called the Koopman operator. Okay, we can't write it down. I mean, it's you know, it's identity plus lt plus one half l squared t squared and so forth. Right? Okay. So, if we have that, then the temporal evolution. of rho of that t is given by what's called the Liouville equation. So the Liouville equation says e rho dt is L star rho, and we again specify an initial condition Rho naught of z. Okay, so let's um, first of all discuss solutions here. So again, formally we can write that rho of z t is now e to the l star t rho naught of z, and this operator here has also its special name. Goes under several names. So one is the frobenius peron operator. And the other one, sometimes is, some people call it the transfer operator. Are you going to talk about this, Jean-Luc? Okay. Yeah, but I mean, yeah, but are you, no, spectral gaps, things like, no, okay. Okay. So, 
Now let's show that this solution here, so we have this solution, then we know it satisfies, we can kind of write, okay, it will satisfy this equation. So let's show now, given the information we have, which is we have a solution to the ODE, okay? So H is Lipschitz, everything fine. And this one here has a classical solution, okay? And now if we make those assumptions, then this is our role. Okay. So for that we need one more definition, which is we introduce an expectation value of some function f of z, and that is now the average over our initial data. Okay, so we take the average of f of z with respect to the distribution given by the raw node. It's just notation. Okay. All right. So now we're going to show <coughs> this equation here. So we, first we know that the expectation value of phi of z of t is, well, by definition, phi of z of t, rho of z, dz. Okay? It's just the definition of it. So phi z of t, this is the small phi on some z node. Okay? On some z. And so I can write this as propagating in time with the Koopman operator, e to the lt. Right? This is what we found out Found out here, right? this is a phi, phi t of z, which is v of z t, which we said was e to the lt phi. Okay. So this is e to the lt phi z. Sorry, I should write it like this, phi of z, rho naught of z dz. And now we use this one, we take the adjoint of this. We bring this on the other side, and that will be, become the adjoint, right? So this is now phi of z, e to the L star t, rho naught of z, dz. That's one part here, okay? But we also know, if we write e, E of phi of z of t, but also expectation value phi of z of t, well, will be my phi of z times my row of some row of z t dz. Just a letter time t, there will be a density, right? So my new row naught in this definition will just be my row of zt. So this, we made no assumptions on phi, except that's an L1 function or whatever. Um, so that means we can identify this, e to the L star t row naught, with this. So e to the L star t row naught is row of zt. Hence, we now have the equation that describes the temporal evolution of a density. Okay. So, almost in over time, um, why are we doing this? Okay. Why, why are we spending so much time talking about these different pictures, right? Why not just carry on with the ODE, right? We all know that's that's what we used to. So. We now converted, or we showed the equivalence of an ODE which is nonlinear, or can be, generically is nonlinear, so very hard to solve, with something that's linear but infinite dimensional. Okay? So we traded finite dimensional for infinite dimensional, if we go to these PDEs for the density or the, or the obs uh, observable, but we gained nonlinear and traded in for linear. 
So now we have linear PDEs, and if we have linear PDEs, there's a whole plethora of perturbation theories we can use. Okay? So this allows us now to, if we want to study ODEs, to use perturbation theory for linear operators. Okay? And that's what we're going to do, and that's how we're going to uh, uh, achieve later on um, our, our model reduction. And I think this is probably a good, good place to stop. Other questions, huh? Oh, I have more. No, I don't, right? On oh, 10 minutes. Awesome. Good. No. Sorry. Okay. Shouldn't have said that, Jean Luc. They hate you now. Okay. So we got these three pictures. And before, so this was all for deterministic systems. So before we go to stochastic systems and do the same spiel, you know have an SDE, not an ODE now, but an SDE, saying what's the evolution equation for density, what's the evolution equation for an expectation value, we define some more kind of concept, some, some terminology that we need to, or some, that, 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 that we will need. So the first two lectures are of preparation before we can actually do the model reduction. Okay. So first, a definition is an invariant measure So an invariant measure is a measure such that mu, if we take is that a, and now we propagate this in time, then the measure of this propagated set will be the same. Okay? So, and this is for all, for all uh, sets, okay, that you allow. Um, so what does that mean? That means if I take a set, my dynamics doesn't do anything, can't do anything anymore to change the measure. Uh, well, in, in uh, Michael's talk, this would be the sigma algebra, okay? In the deterministic case, this would be your phase space, okay? Um, okay. So, this means invariant measures are those measures such that when I let now all these particles move around, or this, or this set move around, let it be, you know, deformed, stretched, what John luc did, he took a set, this blob, let the dynamics evolve, and now he wants that the measure right, is the same of, of his initial blob and the stretched blob. Okay? So these are called invariant measures. Okay? Uh, how do we find them? Remark. How can we find them? Well, we have a formal, we have a formal way of defining them. Right? This means the measure doesn't change. You do anything in time, right? You let all the system evolve, and it doesn't change in time. So don't, d rho dt is zero, so L star rho is zero. So these are kernel modes of, your, of the adjoint of the generator. Okay. Um, so you can find them. It's often very hard to do that. By solving L star rho, I should say rho, I often, here I'm extremely imprecise because I talk about deterministic systems and I now introduce a density, right? If you have a chaotic system or, or anything, you, you normally don't have that. You don't, you don't have densities. These measures are singular. Um, later on, for the stochastic case, we're always going to look at this. Uh, uh, this density picture here, okay? So I'm being very imprecise here, and, and in some sense wrong. Uh, okay, so we have an invariant measure. Now we can define invariant sets. Well, we call a set A invariant 
under the dynamics, so that means under the flow phi t, if for all t, if I take this set A, propagate it in time, it remains the same set. Okay? So what are examples? Well, a fixed point. Fixed point is one example. You start at the fixed point, right? you apply the dynamics, you stay there. Limit cycles, or chaotic attractors. This is a set, right? It's a fractal set, but if you restrict to that set, you remain in that set. Okay. So now we're going to introduce the term ergodicity. And then we can discuss it, I guess, later. So another definition which we will need, a dynamical system is called ergodic if every invariant set A, uh, well, invariant of by T, is such that either this, this set A, the measure of this set A, I'm going to write it as 1, which means it's the full measure, okay, or it has zero measure. So what does that mean? Let's look. Let's look. I got two minutes. Let's look at one um, example that we just make up. Actually, maybe I should make. I should, since we only have two minutes, I'm just going to do this remark because before we discuss this in more, more detail, what it actually means. Let's take a remark. This definition here depends on the measure. Okay, so that's very important to note. So the definition of whether system is ergodic or not depends on what measure I use to evaluate whether my invariant measure has you know, 1 or 0 or not. Right? So take an example. Take x dot is x times 1 minus x squared. Okay. So it's an, an x is in, 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 in R. So we have fixed point, unstable fixed point at 0, stable fixed point at plus 1 minus 1. Okay, let's now, since we want to talk kind of about measures, let's kind of make this here, let's say this is minus 2 and 2, so we only look at this domain here, but we can actually have a measure and, and, uh, which is finite. Okay, so let's take two, two measures. Let's first take, take mu is the Lebesgue measure. So dx. Okay. So now there are two invariant sets. This is an invariant set, right? Because when I start here, I stay in here. Okay. I mean, this point will move into here, but you can always find to replace this point, you always find another pre-image that's closer to zero. Okay. So there are two invariant sets. Uh, minus 1, 0, and 0, minus 1. These invariant sets have no... Uh, um, if, if we take the, uh, uh, the Lebesgue measure, these invariant sets have neither full measure nor of zero measure. The measure is 1, 
Okay? The full measure would be 4, or the zero measure would be 0. Okay? So it's not ergodic. Sorry? Sorry, this is plus 1. Um, no, because it stays there, it's fine. It's fine. Oh, you can have, yeah, you have also invariant sets here, right? Here. And here, right? They're not the only two. Okay? Hmm? There are more than two, yes. There are these three, right? Yes. No, these are not invariant sets. That's not an invariant set. Oh, the open ones too, yes, 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 yes. Um, huh? This is not ergodic with uh, respect to Lebesgue measure. Okay, but let's take mu is, for example, delta of x minus one. Okay. So now, or you could take delta of x, so Dirac measure, or all these ones. Now the system is ergodic with respect to this measure. Okay? So you have to be careful with ergodicity, you have to, right? If you talk about ergodicity, you have to ask again with respect to what, what measure. Okay? Okay, so let's uh, talk on Monday, I think, more about what's the meaning of this ergodicity. Why, why do I make such a fuss about it? Okay? No, because not every, not every system, sorry, say again. Yes, but you need an invariant set. You need an invariant set as well. So not every system has invariant sets. Or the whole, yeah, if you take the whole set, yeah. <laughs> yes. More questions or people are hungry? Well, I'm here anyway, so you can uh, ask me a question. 